Um, I'm Paul Adler. I'm a community optometrist, have two private practices, and I sort of specialise in binocular vision problems. My practice um, has around 30 or 40 patients a week um, with where we teach them uh, eye exercises, and so binocular vision is kind of our, our passion, really. Um, I'm hoping today to explain to you that um, I don't really think binocular vision problems in practice is nearly as difficult as many practitioners believe and I'm hoping to take you through a sequence of uh, demonstrations and information that will allow you to be more confident in practice in due course. It's obvious when you first start doing binocular vision, if you haven't done much before, take on the nice easy cases, ignore the complicated ones, and as your confidence grows and your success grows, because it surely will, then you can take on more complex cases and you can feel much happier in doing so. The prevalence of binocular vision um, issues in practice is actually surprisingly high. So about 8% of, uh, of, of the patients that we see, particularly the child patients in practice, will probably have binocular vision anomalies. And of course you need to remember that those patients that do come are self-selected, often brought by parents who have anomalies or difficulties themselves, anxious that their children are not going to follow suit. Of course, unfortunately, they, they frequently do. Um, about 2 to 4% may have strabismus or possibly even greater numbers in, in, in practice. And um, almost 5% might have some form of amblyopia, even if it's extremely mild. Children, of course, grow up to be adults with the same conditions if they're not reserved, re resolved earlier. So it's a very good idea to try and treat these as early as we possibly can. Um, most of the binocular vision problems in practice are relatively straightforward and in fact the prevalence of uh, simple convergence and accommodation anomalies could be as much as 20 to 30 percent and there are some papers showing results that um, include up to 38 percent. Taking a good history and symptoms is actually the cornerstone of any good examination, whether it be an orthoptic examination or just a routine examination. Of course, you all know the purpose of taking a good symptoms and history. Um, in, in terms of BV, it's to inform your examination because you won't do every single test that you have at your disposable on every patient. It's to identify the risk factors as you go through the, uh, the history and to establish, if you can, when the patient's binocular vision problem uh, started and where possible the course and nature of the condition so how was it treated and what actually happened did it become more consistent or less consistent as time go go by remember though that when you're examining a binocular vision patient it's quite important to um, take into consideration that BV problems change all the time and therefore if you don't see it in the first consultation or if it's intermittent don't worry about asking the patient to come back again that's perfectly okay and a perfectly reasonable thing to do the patient uh, the consultation should be guided by the patient so the first thing that you want to know is well, why has the patient come what's the primary and secondary reasons for visiting and then you take the patient through a series of questions to try and elicit more detail and then finish your history. If you're taking um, a history from a child it's a really good idea to start your consultation by addressing the child. The child is going to be nervous and therefore making a joke or being very friendly as you walk into the consulting room, showing them where they're going to sit, play with the chair if they want to uh, be more relaxed so that they know that you're a nice person and you're not going to hurt them at all and that they, they can cope. One really important tip when you're dealing with children is you should assume that the child themselves doesn't know what normal is. Most children just think that everybody sees the way they do. That's kind of quite interesting because as 
time goes by, uh, they just think that they're unable to be as good as other people. So if you have a patient with an accommodative disorder or a convergence difficulty, they simply think that other people are much better at seeing single or clearly than, than they are, and it's their fault. And they very rarely tell people what um, they're worried about because they just, as I said, assume they are normal. The other thing that's really important and actually is really quite, quite strange is that most adults um, and especially children don't actually know what blur is. So particularly for a child, just explain what you think blurred, blurred vision is. Uh, we use a small, um, a, a, a small sheet of paper that, on which we've printed some text, um, starting at the bottom being absolutely clear and getting more and more blurry so that we can actually explain to the child this is what blur looks like. So, it, similarly, the same thing applies to, to diplopia. Adults frequently, when you ask them to tell you when it goes blurry or double, will interpret blur as double and vice versa. So sometimes it's good to really show the patient exactly what you mean so that they can be sure about what you want. And remember, when you're dealing with, uh, with patients, what you mean when it's blurred is not too blurred to read, but just it's not completely sharp and, and clear. The very first question that I would ask any patient coming for a binocular vision assessment is uh, what brought them and what their primary concerns are. Um, for children, it's really important to ask the parents why they think uh, what they're worried about so that you can answer the concerns of the, of the parents, which is very important to reassure them. And during your history, you also need to know the age of onset of the presenting symptoms that's actually vital for binocular vision situations. Who actually noticed them? Was it noticed at nursery? Was it noticed at school? Or is it noticed by the child or, or parents? So it gives you an idea of how often it is happening. And you need to know that as well as what time of day the symptoms, if any, or the signs occur. How fast did it come on? Was it not there one day and then suddenly it appeared and has got much worse since. And is it constant? Is it sometimes there or sometimes not there? Sometimes asking a parent to keep a diary if you're not sure over a period of a month or so is actually really quite useful. And also remember to ask about the patient's general health when the symptoms or signs first present themselves. So was there febrile illness? Were they sick? Were they exceptionally tired? Uh, were they suffering from a nasty cold and have you seen it since? And obviously a very important aspect is has this patient seen uh, an eye care practitioner previously? Are they spectacle wearers? Have they received any treatment in the past? And if so, who provided the treatment? When was it provided? And how well did they comply with the advice? Because frequently patients are offered treatment and are abandoning their treatment because they can't be bothered or they can't make their child do what they need to do. And that's really, really important. And again, family ocular history, really important as we'll see in a bit more detail in a minute. So if we talk about age of onset then to begin with, the earlier that you intervene, the better. And that's quite, uh, qu quite obvious. If you can determine the precise date um, or month that the binocular vision problem occurred, the great advantage there is that you've got a pretty good idea of how long good cortical binocular stimulation has been present. And the longer the, that period, the better the prognosis will be. And that obviously makes a difference to how you approach the patient, how, much, how passive or intensive you make the treatment, and what you tell the patient, because the patient wants to know, am I going to get better, or is this child going to improve it or not? Remember that um, there are certain kind of key situations that are fairly obvious to look out for. So uh, children who have esotropia or esophorias very often present at around about the age of three years, although some say between two and five. And the exophorias or exotropes come out a little bit later, usually around about the age of five or seven. And the esotropes come out earlier because if they're going to be predisposed to esotropia at around four months and beyond, um, the children start to use their accommodative systems more um, expertly. And, 
at the age of three and four, they're starting to read more books and doing much more close work. They're paying more attention to their visual world at near, and therefore they're using more accommodation again. So you're more likely to see the accommodative isotropes come out, out of the cupboard and into your consulting room. The exophores and patients with decompensating exophoria, they're quite interesting because we see those regularly at the ages of sort of seven, but they, they pop up just before exam time quite regularly. So if they're going to decompensate, they're going to decompensate at around SATS time, so maybe years, sort of age 10, frequently as they start or, or get towards their first GCSE modules and then into A-levels, and they frequently complain that they can't cope. Ideally, it's best to treat them way before their next exam, which might be next week. So um, seeing patients regularly is, is really worth worthwhile. In terms of um, symptoms, the frequency and symptoms give you a little bit of a guidance. So severe annoying symptoms, which um, are there in terms of binocular vision, are most likely to be of recent onset. Patients don't kind of allow them to go on for too long if they're causing distress. And you do, though, need to rule out on those cases incompetences. And you need to think about things like uh, diabetes, which commonly cause ocular palsies, and Graves disease, strokes, etc. If they're not kind of sudden, but they are um, decompensating exophores, they'll be more intermittent. And those patients uh, are likely to complain of symptoms that are much worse with stress or if they're unwell or if they're exceptionally tired or if they've got deadlines to meet at work uh, or at school where they have to put a huge amount of extra effort in. So increasing workload often makes these patients struggle much more. Long-standing conditions, well, the symptoms are pretty well zero unless they're incompetent. And um, remember that you can get incompetencies that continue that you don't need to refer. So things like Duane's syndrome or Brown's, um, Brown's tendon sheath um, syndrome, there's no point in referring those patients because they've already been investigated and it's not a new, new lesion. So patients who've got long-standing conditions often adapt by suppressing or developing abnormal retinal correspondence, and they should be asymptomatic, although they can decompensate even if they've had an abnormal retinal correspondence. Probably the most likely types of binocular vision problems that uh, most of us would prefer to treat are the decompensating heterophorias, because they're quite easy to, to manage, and they present quite often as intermittent blur, both for distance and for near, uh, light sensitivity is common and patients frequently complain of asthenopic symptoms uh, and headaches. One quite common symptom is patients who complain when they're reading that words appear to move or float from the page. This isn't necessarily Ms. Erland sy syndrome. It, it's quite often um, poor ocular alignment at near and inability to maintain it. And another thing to ask, particularly ch children, if they shut one eye or tend to try and cover one eye, which suggests their adaptation is physical. They're trying very hard to get rid of their double vision by occluding. And that's quite, quite useful. Uh, poor concentration is something else that we see quite regularly in the practice. Patients present for poor con concentration. They've got convergence insufficiencies. And poor hand-eye coordination is actually common, particularly in fast ball sports, clumsiness sometimes, especially if we've got decompensating exophorias um, where the patient kind of keeps on changing their ocular alignment status. On the day of the examination, um, the patient may have no symptoms. And so, as I've said before, if you've got a constant angle strabismus, you can expect absolutely no symptoms at all. It rarely gives rise to any problems. But intermittent symptoms might not be present when the patient comes to see you. And we frequently will ask the patient to come back on another day, often on a Thursday or a Friday when they're more likely to be tired, and often in the afternoons or early evenings when they're, they're more likely to be struggling. And that makes it much more likely that you will see the um, that the binocular vision problem that that is there. So just because you don't see the problem, don't assume that the patient's completely normal and send them away. Consider bringing them back on another day, and I think that's a very valid and very important point to make.
uh, when you're taking history and symptoms, remember that um, you want to know when the problems occur. So if the patient's getting lots of blurred blur vision or discomfort, is it happening after work? Is it happening in the morning? Does it happen when they wake? Because it's much less likely to be a visual problem, binocular vision wise anyway. Is it after close work or playing on their Xbox or um, other computer games? Is it when they've spent huge amounts of time doing homework or, or when they're, they're at work after they've spent three or four hours doing some complicated task on their PC? Or in fact, don't forget, it could be after television and driving. We do think a lot about close visual problems in binocular vision work, but quite a few patients will complain of intermittent blurred or double vision for distance. And in those cases, you need to, to, to listen to what the patient's telling you. And those are most likely to be at the end of the day when people are driving home from work. The speed of onset is also quite, quite important. So a sudden onset diplopia needs you to take attention, pay careful attention. Evaluate those patients, particularly if they also present with headaches. And you need to remember that those could be caused not by decompensating heterophorias, but by vascular accidents, again, di di diabetes comes to mind immediately, space-occupying lesions, um, malignant hypertension sometimes, but also raised intracranial pressure and some of the more kind of, uh, well, rarer d diseases that you're likely to see in practice, w which will be things like um, inner carotid uh, dissection, which can cause a thunderclap headache and is quite serious. Those patients you need to identify, send off to hospital fairly quickly. But in those patients, don't forget that if you're doing a binocular vision workup, it doesn't preclude you from using your vault lens and doing their fields. And I would suggest that that is a very important point and part of all binocular vision work. General health is also important. Um, the type of health problems that the patient have or has could be associated with binocular vision difficulties. And if you've got febrile illnesses particularly, or patients, as I say, have been very unwell, you're likely to exacerbate pre-existing um, pre -existing tendencies to, to decompensate. And patients who've been marginally okay and cope quite well can suddenly find that they're no longer able to, to cope. And that also includes patients with accommodative insufficiency Although, word of warning, uh, patients who have normal accommodation and then get sick very frequently have poor accommodative amplitudes and you have to work out whether the accommodative amplitude is to do with um, the condition or whether it's been there all the time. And don't forget the moderate to high hypermetropia in patients who've previously just about coped and refused to wear spectacles. They can quite easily find that the extra effort to accommodate when they're unwell will cause uh, a decompensating for it to, to develop and then they can no longer cope and it's, it's uncomfortable. So don't forget the dead simple refractive scenarios that can actually um, cause patients to decompensate when, when unwell. So I'm just going to talk a bit more about family ocular history. I've already mentioned that between 2 and 4% of uh, our patients ought to have strabismus. Um, but uh, children presenting in our practices theoretically ought to have, uh, well, there ought to be as many as 10% that have some form of squint. Uh, visual difficulties, as I've said, um, vary between 15% and maybe up to 38%. But it's quite important to think about the chances of the patient in your chair having a binocular vision problem. So for instance, if you've got a child that you're seeing for the first time, um, and that child happens to have a parent who has a squint, there's about a 12% chance that the child in the chair will be a strabismic patient. If that parent also happens to have hypermetropia over two diopters, then the 12% rises to 18%, which is getting to be quite significant. If the family history of strabismus and hypermetropia is actually particularly strong, as opposed to just a mother or just a father, then 50% chance is what you're looking at for the patient in your chair having a problem. And if there is a hugely strong family history of both high hypermetropia with strabismus or amblyopia, then the patient in your chair is likely to have a binocular vision problem at a level of about 86%. And that's actually a huge chance. So by taking a history, you know that you've got to, to do at least a good rudimentary binocular vision work, work up to rule out some of those difficulties. 
Um, the birth history is quite interesting as well and quite important. Uh, we're all aware that very low birth weight um, babies are much more likely to have uh, visual problems and um, we know about retinopathy of prematurity so anybody who has less a birth weight of less than 2,500 grams is more at risk for a BV problem and you then know that you've got to look a little bit more carefully but remember that any patient who has been born using the help of forceps or possibly von twos could have extraocular muscle damage and if there's any issues during caesarean section those patients often have visual developmental problems although mild there often are, are problems in perceptual development birth trauma of any sort is is a problem or in the early years or any years to come to think of it tra trauma is important but also don't forget to think about non-accidental injury which as optometrists we should always be looking out for as well as um, patients whose parents had um, kind of drug abuse or uh, alcohol problems during um, the pregnancy where you may well then see uh, a mild to severe fetal alcohol syndrome with all the difficulties that that might, uh, might, might bring but also taking into account the parents or particularly the mother's systemic diseases that she may have suffered from during the pregnancy which might have an impact on uh, what you're looking at uh, when you start to examine the child. Um, we've already mentioned previous treatment and the reason that that's important especially on the compliance side is that if a patient presents particularly who has anisometropia without strabismus and has not done um, or has not complied very well with previous orthoptic intervention those patients frequently are extremely successful if you start patching even above the age of seven or eight and I have a patient that we treated recently at the age of 30 with who was an anisometropic hyperope plonum in one eye about plus six in the other and that patient has gone from about 660 when we first met him to six over 7.5 um, by using contact lenses patching and some active uh, active vision therapy in those cases you could easily take on by asking the patients initially to wear contacts or spectacles for about 18, 18 weeks at the beginning before you review them and you often don't need to do much more than that to get good results so do take those on nobody can come to any harm there will be no diplopia you won't have any real issues but it, it is worth a go um, we need to assess or ask about medications just because a child is small doesn't mean to say that there are none and don't forget grown-ups have um, binocular vision problems so it's good to understand and it's really important to understand that even in small children who may be taking drugs that have an anticholinergic effect they will get blurred vision and double vision so you need to think about um, the typical anticholinergics that we deal with but you need to think about antihistamines which can cause drowsiness and blurred vision in ch children as well as adults beta blockers although not usually given for children can be um, can cause disturbances to the vision and dry eyes and then anybody on a, a tranquilizer or antipsychotic could suffer binocular vision disorders due to decompensation particularly due to reduced accommodative, accommodative function now it's a bit strange for me to say this but it, it's probably a bit obvious but just do look at your patient we're actually dealing with people who have eyes as opposed to eyes who belong to people and your patient will tell you an awful lot so look out as a patient sitting in your waiting room and as your patient's sort of comfortably settling down in your chair whilst you're having a brief chat for head tilts head turns and um, chin elevations and depressions which can suggest that there is a binocular vision problem or a deep compensating foria. Those postural changes can be present not just in straightforward BV problems, but if you have a patient with nystagmus where you'll get a head turn to uh, reduce the amount of movement in the eye. Uh, and you can see them also in, um, in presbyopia sometimes. So some patients who are struggling with their presbyopic uh, symptoms will will move their heads to one side in a, in a huge effort of the whole torso and head just simply to make the accommodation work and those may actually be simple accommodative issues that you need to deal with in, a, in a, an easy straightforward way with uh, plus lenses.
So I'd like to move on to um, talking about some of the tests that we use. None of them in our practice are very complicated and you will know most of them already. So the, the obvious one to tell you about is the cover test. It's essential. You can't do a routine assessment, in my view, without doing a good cover test. And you should, of course, remember that it's not really a cover test. It should be called a cover uncover test. It's the only test that will allow us to tell the difference between euphoria and atropia. And to that end, it, it's really important to, to do it accurately. Many of us have been taught to estimate the degree of heterophoria, but you might be interested to know that research has shown that uh, you can be nearly 13 prism diopters wrong on an, an ear cover test, particularly if you're relatively inexperienced. So it's probably a good idea to measure them, and it's probably a good idea to um, use a prism cover test, which is fairly straightforward. I always use an opaque occluder when I'm doing any binocular vision work and when I'm using, doing a cover test. This allows the patient to be pretty well occluded. It cuts the acuity down in the covered eye to around about 660, but it allows me to see what's going on underneath the cover, and that can be quite useful sometimes. The art of a cover test it is very straightforward, but one of the things I always suggest people do is to first of all check the ability of the patient to maintain fixation. It's almost impossible to get a good cover test if your patient is looking all over the place because you don't know whether the eye movement is due to inattention and, as I say, poor fixation. And you need to remember that a patient with poor attention could also have a BV problem. So you do need to sort it out very carefully. Make sure that when you're doing a cover test that the patient fixates the target that is above his visual threshold. Concentrate really nicely on the pen. Where are you looking now? On the point of the pen? Perfect. And again, still the point of the pen. Keep watching. Well done, you. That was really interesting. It's not very easy for a patient, if you give them something that's dead blurred, to be able to keep their attention on it. So make, make sure that they can see it quite, quite well. And make sure that you've got good lighting. But be aware that if you give too much lighting, it might be good for you, but the patient will suffer glare, and therefore they will find it very difficult to fi fixate. So when you're doing a cover test, start with a six meter cover test. Um, most of you will, I'm sure, do that anyway. Um, but there are some conditions that don't manifest themselves at six meters. So if your history suggests discomfort, blurred vision, double vision for distance, and you find nothing on cover test at six meters, um, do try and test at a longer distance. And my staff will uh, willingly admit to you that every now and again, patients come trundling out of my consulting room wearing a trial frame and with me carrying a prison bar and a cluder. And we whiz outside and I get the patient to look at the sign from the dental surgery um, way up the road and I'll do a cover test in the street. And there's absolutely no good reason why you shouldn't. And the divergence excess exotropias um, and there are probably more than you think of them out there, you will not pick up unless you do a really quite a long distance cover test. At near, well, most people think you should do it around 40 centimetres, but of course the best distance to do a near cover test is the habitual working distance of the patient. And don't forget, you can do a cover test simply at um, intermediate as well as at near. So if a patient's complaining of asthenopic symptoms for his computer screen, um, do it at 70 or 80 centimetres if that's where the screen is placed. When you're doing a cover test, it's actually better to remove the cover vertically than to switch from one side to the other. Um, if you do switch from one side to the other going horizontally, you can easily cover test yourself and then you'll find observing the patient's actually quite difficult because you won't be binocular um, all of the time. How long should you keep the cover 
over the eye. Well, that's quite contentious. According to Professor Bruce Evans, um, around about two seconds, or at least two seconds, is a good time. But um, Dr. Barnard, in his um, in his dissertation, or sorry, in his thesis for his PhD, did some experiments that suggest between four and five seconds would actually be significantly better. Don't forget that if you've got a patient who's an amblyope or who has significant hypermetropia but isn't wearing any correction, then that patient will take much, much longer to click in their accommodation and to figure out where it is that they've got to look. So you need to leave a little bit more time for those patients. And beware of those patients on whom you see absolutely no movement, but who appear to have marginal visual issues. Those patients may have a small su suppression zone centrally, and the best way to detect that is by using a four prism base out test. It's extremely easy to do. You simply get the patient to fixate uh, whatever target you've deemed to be the most appropriate, insert a four prism diopter lens with its base outwards, and watch for the eye movement. Wow, that's a nice movement. We're just going to switch it over to the other eye. We'll notice the movement much more when we take it away. We'll do that one again. I'll just compare it with this one. Now, I find it quite difficult quite often to see much eye movement when you put the prism in, but when you take the prism out, you should see the movement go in the opposite direction. So when the prism goes in, you should see the eye under the prism move inwards a little bit and when you remove it it should actually reverse and move outwards again so you have two opportunities to check and if you don't see any movement uh, just do it again to make sure that you, you are certain of what you're seeing. Estimating cover tests as I say can be quite difficult but every now and again I kind of recalibrate the amount of movement I'm seeing in my brain and just double check that I've got it right and you can do this very easily if you ask the patient to look at the 612 line of your test chart or the Logmar equivalent. Most of the 612 line is about 12 centimetres from one end to the other and if you ask your patient to look from one end to the other then that is the equivalent movement that correlates to two prism diopters of movement and some people get, are very surprised how little that is. So you can easily see uh, two diopterphoria and it's quite good to estimate the amount of movement and then of course you can extrapolate that upwards for larger deviations. So if you just look at the tip of the pen, so this is six prism diopters and to take the lens away we can see what your eye does. That's great and I'm going to make it a little bit more, so this is eight prism diopters. Brilliant, you can feel that, can't you? Yeah. yeah, feels really funny. And again, looking at the tip of the pan, this is 10, you'll feel this even more. <laughs> Uncomfortable? Okay. It's a real strain, and we're going to do one more just, just to annoy you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, if you just look at that one. Brilliant. There are a few quite interesting pointers when you're doing cover tests um, that you might want to be thinking about as you're working with your patient. And that is that according to uh, Dr. Barnard, there should be no differences between the foria in either eye if you've got a patient with completely normal binocular vision. And that does seem to be the case. So if you get a difference in foria between your left and right eyes, you need to have a good look and find out why that is. It's worth using the alternating cover test to actually confirm the deviation or to confirm the direction of the deviation. And it gives you an idea as to how bad the binocular vision problem is if it breaks down really quickly on alternating. Those patients that recover really fast, who doesn't, whose kind of deviation doesn't increase hugely, um, are generally those who have better binocular function. If you're going to measure with a prism bar, which is the most accurate way of measuring a, um, a cover test, although some authorities will argue with you that the mere presence of the cover bar, the prism bar actually will alter what it is that you're measuring, and they're probably right, but it is a very accurate way of doing it. But if you're using a 
prison bar in a patient who has a squint. Be very careful. If you use and measure it um, using the prism in the non-fixing eye, you'll be measuring the primary angle. But if you use it in the fixing eye, then you will be measuring the secondary angle, which will then be much greater. So use, use, the, um, use the former rather than the latter for accurate assessment. The speed of any recovery in a cover test has been shown to be a good predictor of the quality of binocular vision or the lack of quality. But the number of movements that you see in, a, in order to recover has not been related to symptoms. And uh, you, you're worth, it's worth noting, but it has less significance. So if we move on to motilities, and I guess this is where most people who are thinking about binocular vision sort of uh, get extremely worried. So um, I'm going to um, reassure you, I'm not going to talk about details of anatomy and physiology, but just to give you some tips to, to make it much easier. So the best way of doing it is probably to use a focus pen torch placed at 50 centimetres, although this can get a little bit tricky um, if you're trying to do a cover test, which you should be doing in all nine cardinal points of, of gaze. Make sure that you don't move your pen torch too far to the periphery. If you do, you're bound to find some incompetencies that you don't want to see. And it's perfectly reasonable, very, very far out in the extremes of gaze, when the patient's outside of their binocular field of view, for whatever reason, the eyebrow or nose, that they're going to find it difficult to maintain single binocular vision. So since we know that the um, extraocular muscles join on at the ISA superior rectus at about 23, centi uh, 23 degrees, uh, you don't need to go much more if you're trying to test a superior rectus or inferior rectus than 23 degrees from the primary position. The obliques are a little bit more, so you don't really need to go any more than about 45 or 50 degrees to test their effectivity. And I would suggest that you, you try very hard not to go any further out than that whilst you're doing motilities. Before you start though, it's really important to have a look at the pupil reflexes in each eye. Because as you're aware, the reflex from your pen light may not actually be in the pupil centre if the corneal centre is actually not coincident with the pupil centre. And angle kappa is quite an important um, measurement, or not a measurement, but it's a, an important factor to take into consideration. So start off by occluding one eye and asking your patient to fixate your pen torch. Note where the pupil reflex is. You know that that is the straight ahead for that patient and do the same thing in with, with the other eye because the two eyes of course could be different. When you're doing motilities it doesn't really matter whether you use your H pattern or whether you use a star pattern, whatever you become more comfortable with is okay but it does matter quite significantly if you move your pen torch too fast. And in the days where we had PQE, some of the candidates were uh, very rapid and that precludes from actually seeing uh, any anomalies of binocular vision because you don't give the patient a chance either to tell you what it is or yourself a chance to be able to, to observe whether you have an overaction or an underaction. Now, I would always advise practitioners when they're doing motility tests not to try and work out which eye muscle is which unless they're quite confident and experienced. And if you haven't done a lot of binocular vision work, trying to work out which of the muscles is misbehaving is a nightmare. So I would just draw a diagram and a picture or write down what the eyes did. And then when the patient's gone home, you can get your textbooks out and you can have a bit of a look. And even if you are quite um, experienced, uh, you'll find that quite a few practitioners will do 
just that. You can always add to your records afterwards when you've had a time, time to think. As I've said before, remember when you're doing motilities, always do a cover test, especially if you find any anomalies in, in the nine cardinal points of gaze. And remember that actually technically, moving the pen torch vertically through the midline isn't part of the motilities test because it doesn't test any particular muscle groups in, in their sort of fullest extent. But it does help you identify whether the patient has so-called alphabetical patterns, an A pattern or an X pattern or a V pattern. And that will help you understand why the patient may be decompensating um, in the distance, for instance, if there's a V pattern, which indicates there's an increasing exophoria as the patient looks up. And incidentally, relating that to the way that you observe your patients, and we talked a bit earlier on in terms of posture, a patient with a v, v pattern will alter his head posture in order to make it easy so he'll lift his head a little bit so that he, he finds convergence a bit easier. If you haven't seen an X pattern before, um, it, it's quite strange when you first, first meet them. This is where the patient on up gaze appears to be slightly divergent and as you bring the pen torch down towards the primary, the, the primary position, the um, two eyes come together and you have alignment so there's no abnormality and yet when you come down even further the patient diverges again so they're divergent both high and low but they're okay in the middle and these patients typically present with asthenopic symptoms if they've got odd jobs that they're doing that require them either to look up a long way or down down a long way a pilot's come to mind as, as one of the most common manifestations of difficulties in, in that situation or could, could easily be if we go back to our motility testing, um, Professor Evans suggests, and it's quite a good system, that if you see something that you're not really uh, sure about, that you do the motilities tests up to three times. On the first occasion, you don't let the patient speak, you just observe. And the trouble with patients is that they'll tell you blurred is double, as I've mentioned before, and they don't really necessarily um, know what you're thinking or what you're trying to observe at any one time. So if they get diplopia in many positions of gaze, they're going to be constantly telling you you've got, they've got double vision or blurred vision. And actually that makes it hard for you to observe and think. So do it start with just with a simple observation and cover test. Secondly, ask them to, to ask your patient to explain to you or tell you when they experience double vision. And as you're going around and they're telling you that they're getting double vision, try and get the patients to tell you on each occasion whether it's more or less than the preceding occasion so that you can identify the direction of gaze which produces the largest separation. If you then want to work out and you're not completely sure what's going on, um, most of us have got trial sets and most of us have got red and green filters in those trial sets. If you put those on the patient or use red and, and green or red and blue goggles, you can then actually work out very easily which image belongs to which eye when the patient is diplopic as you're doing a motilities test. And it's actually a really quite a, a, an easy thing to do. And then you can draw a little diagram in all nine cardinal points as to which eye is seeing what and, and where. And that will help you work out which, which muscles are overacting or underacting. A really good tip is when patient reports double vision, ask them to observe the position of the two images and notice that one is further away compared to them than the other. Cover one eye and ask them which image disappears, the nearest or the further. And from our point of view, it's always rather good because the image belonging to the, so the furthest image always belongs to the underacting eye. So you'll instantly know which eye is uh, underacting. Okay, now this time I'm going to do it again. I'd like you to tell me when you get double vision. Okay? Just... Good. So... Beautiful. Which one disappears, the nearest image or the furthest away? 
Which of the two torches go? The nearest one or the furthest one? The furthest one. Furthest one. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Remember though, one of the problems with motility is testing, and we always think about single muscles that are misbehaving, is that you can have a lot that have gone wrong, particularly if the patient's previously had surgery for squints. And you get ocular, you, you get muscle sequelae, which then can kind of equalize the movements and make it much more difficult for you to work out which one's which. But don't dismiss the possibility that your patient might have two or three eye muscles that are misbehaving.